All right. Welcome back after a nice little break there to uh, class four, part two. And we are going to be going over the uh, different types of armatures, um, as discussed by Edgar Payne in his book, Composition of Outdoor Painting. You got my copy of it right here. I can see all my notes in there. Um, and I grabbed a couple other books that are really useful on design and composition. Um, this one being one of the most popular, at least with those like eight pages that I talked about. Um, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. If anybody doesn't have this book, this is the first one you should buy pretty much. Um, and yeah, you can just see throughout all the pages, all the highlighter. And this is my second version of this book. Uh, the first one was almost all highlighters. I do read and reread this book often or revisit it. Um, Michael, what was the name of the very first book that you showed, please? The very first sure. one? Yep. It is Edgar Payne, Composition of Outdoor Painting. Is that showing it backwards or forwards yeah. for you guys? Backwards. Ed Edgar Payne. I don't know why. That's so weird. Let's see if I can do mirror. There we go. And something about comp competition. Yeah. Now is it showing it the right way? No. no. But it's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, this one's Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. The only um, bad thing in this book is that all the illustrations are all in black and white, even when he's discussing color. Um, oh. But still a really useful book. Did he have a first name or is that his last name? Oh, John F. Carlson. John F. Okay, thank you. Yep, great painter. I got to see a number of his paintings when I was in Boston last time. That was really neat to have read his book and reread his book a couple times to uh, actually finally get to see him in color. <laughs> where, um, did you, where did you saw what? Where did you see his paintings? Uh, all over the place, actually. Um, there's a yeah, a number of the art galleries had them like as resale paintings and stuff. So oh. that was really crazy. Oh. Um, then the next book is just composition, um, understanding line, no tan and color by Arthur Wesley, which hand Arthur Wesley Dow. Um, this one's uh, almost really simplistic and he really just talks about the use of no tan black and white a lot. But again, how to kind of lead the viewer throughout talks a lot about balance. Um, it's a book I need to actually sit down and really read. I've just kind of skipped through different sections on this book. It's a newer one for me. It's one that's been brought up though for years and years. Who's the author on that one? What's that? What Who's the author? Arthur Wesley Dow. Can you spell How do and you spell How do you spell his last name? D O W. Oh, okay, thank you. And then this thank is another you. book that falls into that same camp as a book that a lot of my friends talk about quite a bit. Uh, Group A on, I think that's how you say his name, on painting. Also got to see some of his paintings in Boston. Um, there are a lot of the East Coast painters that you just don't see as much of their work on the West Coast. But um, this is another book that I, you know, have not read yet. I just, I actually got these two recently. That's why they're nice and shiny and don't have any paint splattered on them yet. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. But I just thought I would share books that I have heard a lot about or have read a number of times. Um, with the Edgar Payne book, um, I literally have the pages, you know, this is a little piece of papers in there just so I know so I can skip right to them. Um, but we, I went ahead and got some scans of them and printed them. So you do have a one page printout that you can use. I put it into your email and uh, also into our Padlet page. And I will be looking at this as I'm talking about it. And I'll try to bring the pages up onto our screen by doing the screen share here. And let's go ahead and do that. All right. So here is the page. You guys are seeing the black and white. And then to the right of it, a picture of a horse and a little boy. So that is, a. I just wanted to share that I actually do paint animals sometimes. That's a painting I did for my sister of her son, Wyatt, and their baby uh, Norwegian Fjord horse. And I wanted to Beautiful. show it 
not only just to say, hey, yep, I also paint animals sometimes, um, should paint them more. But uh, but even within this picture, let's see if I can blow it up. Um, even within this, there is the beginning of an S-curve that kind of leads the eye through the painting. Um, and I do remember painting this, even though it was a couple of years ago, of having like the ear literally touching the mountain behind it and just, oh, you know, got to bring that mountain up or I could have taken it down. Just looking for tangents. I do notice that the hair is a little bit of a tangent now. Um, but anyways, even if you're doing portraiture or animals or whatever else, these design concepts are still really useful for us. I, th oh, where am I? This isn't some of the names. All right, we're going to start with this one. All right, so these are some of the primary design armatures. Does everybody understand what I say what I when I use the word armature? If you can imagine uh, making a clay, clay sculpture of a figure or something like that, a lot of times what the sculptor will do is they will take some wire and build the like skeleton as it were, of the figure they're going to sculpt out of the clay. And you can actually attach the clay to that wire underneath. Um, and so that's just kind of what I mean by armature. It could also just be the elements of design or whatever else. But I like the idea of armature because it's just this very bare bones. Again, if you think of just wire, like making a stick figure, and you could bend it in this way and that, and then you would build the clay on top of that. Um, that's kind of what this is. Like, if we look at this design element, the pyramid, um, da Vinci used the pyramid a lot in his paintings. A lot of the Renaissance painters uh, used it a lot. Um, a lot of religious work uses the pyramid because it kind of creates a hierarchy in it. Um, and you can see that it's not always just this perfect pyramid. Because, like, look at this, his examples here are, you know, there's gaps. So the eye still skims across and creates this pyramid structure. Here he's got big gaps where he's got this cloud up between them. Um, the pyramid risks the, um, the problem that it can become very balanced and kind of boring, but it definitely helps to lead the eye, giving a hierarchy. Again, in religious work, oftentimes you'd have, you know, God or the angels or whatever, and everybody looking up towards them. Um, all right, the cross, this is a one that's used a lot. I use this one a, um, a lot, a lot, because I do a lot of reflections, right? So if I had a tree here, it would be here, the horizon line, which I may have some elements. Here's examples of like the masts from this boat um, and the horizon line. Uh, some of my very favorite paintings of Edgar Payne are of his uh, boats with their sails up. Um, here's a little more complicated. You can see it kind of repeating, and this will also be brought up in another form of balance, but it's basically a dark and a dark, or a light and a light, whatever you're using. The radiating line, this is a trickier one for a lot of people, but if you're doing big skies or ocean scenes, uh, this one can be really useful. A lot of fields, um, plowed fields or vineyards in my case, really work well with the radiating lines. Um, I did grab a couple of these as examples, so we'll share, I'll share those here in a little bit. But a lot of times you can use these radiating lines, whatever this shape is that he's built here, you can see that it's pretty hard to ignore it, right? Because everything's pointing the eye right towards it. So radiating line is one that I will use quite often. I don't use it all the way around my uh, painting surface very often because I feel like it becomes too obvious. Um, like in this example he uses here, literally all the clouds point at it as well as all of the, the roads. You know, But you can use it, especially in the beginning of your painting, and then you can decide which ones of these can I kind of lose or soften? How can I make this trail? Um, just like we were talking about Linda's painting with the trail leading up to the big heavy cloud, um, you can kind of begin to lose some of these guidelines 
a little bit because the viewer will fill those in and travel back into space just fine. Also, a lot of times when people use the radiating lines, it becomes very centered, very much like iconic or icon paintings. Um, so just be aware that you can do it in a very subtle way. Because watch these lines. We lost your voice. You lost my voice. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Can you guys I did it. Now? Oh, you're back. Okay, great. Um, so anyways, what I was saying is it doesn't need to be in the center. It doesn't need to be so described because like in this radiating line, it's the road rolling back. And then he's got softer radiating lines bringing the viewer back in the sky. And maybe he would have a cloud up here, like a soft, you know, grayish cloud kind of coming down as well. So radiating line, I will often combine that with another element in my painting using the radiating line in my initial sketch and then losing a lot of the impact because it becomes kind of too obvious sometimes. The L or the rectangle is another one. I also will equate this to the steel yard, which we'll show here in just a little bit. But the L formation or rectangular formation, a lot, a lot of artists use it, especially when they're doing like a stand of trees and then it opens up to a big vista. So here's a great example of that. Um, so you have these big trees that are right up kind of closer to us, you know, maybe 10 yards away. And then you've got this big open field like vista with little tiny trees way back there. So you got this very nice, very clean shape. So you're going to have plenty of information in your trees but then you also have plenty of space for your clouds. You can flip this completely and make it, you know, about reflections. Uh, just know that all of these can be turned, right? So here would be the reverse, right? He's got it on the other side. So kind of a reverse L uh, formation. So it's coming back this way. Um, we'll also look at some of uh, Edgar Payne's paintings here in just a minute. And you'll see that he does these, uh, are those called mesas or whatever the big rock formations that stick up out of the desert um, and either cast a shadow or catch the light, whichever way he really experimented a lot with this design. And then one other thing I want you to observe when we get to looking at um, Edgar Payne's paintings is oftentimes he would throw a tiny little figure or a horse or something in there for scale, be just like no bigger than that little hand that's on the screen there. All right, so then he has examples of them above. You can see the triangle here. You can see the plus and almost the, the L as well. <clears throat> and the radiating lines again, everything kind of leading our eye in. And again, if he had some clouds, it might be kind of softly coming down here to counter that line. All right, page one. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. The rectangular is the same as the uh, steel yard, right? Quite similar, yeah. With the uh, steel yard, oftentimes you're going to look for a little more of a counterbalance. Okay. okay. Yeah, but I, I often will think of them as the same, or I don't really differentiate personally that much. With the steel yard, a lot of times what you're looking for is the balance. So he likes to use the example of like a teeter-totter. And where if you move the axis point of it, where it's actually teetering on, um, it will change the balance. So oftentimes you can have a big shape counterbalanced by a little shape by moving the axis point over. So it's actually, in this case, when you talk about balance, he's actually being literal. Like you can, you know, you can have a kid on a teeter-totter and an adult on a teeter-totter if the adult scoots in towards the axis point and the kids way out far. So it's kind of a fun, interesting thought experiment almost when you're out there uh, kind of designing that. Um, I, I use this one quite a lot as well and just trying to kind of counterbalance. I like to have big trees you know, for my foreground and then I might move some other trees a little further back. Uh, both of these examples are something that I could see myself doing quite often. Uh, just be aware, this one can be completely flipped upside down, too, and works fantastically well. You may have examples of that. The balanced scales. I've never heard anybody else use this. This is a very dangerous one. 
it's hard to do this one correctly because it becomes very boring very quickly when you have equally weighted sides. But if you play up like the light streaking across or more atmosphere or whatever else, it can work. But you can see how this painting feels very still. It feels very weighted and heavy and doesn't have a lot of action line in it. And um, so it's just kind of uh, consistently weighted. Um, I, when I first started painting and selling landscapes, I did a ton of these um, balanced scales where you would see it'd be like the exact same width of trees on each side, like you're looking through a strand of trees to the background. And I couldn't quite realize why they were kind of boring. And it wasn't until I started going, oh, I can put more trees on one side, maybe just one little tree on the other side to counterbalance and then make the vista behind it more interesting. All right, the circular. When I used to do illustration work, um, I did a lot of circular design because my goal was to kind of keep the viewer within the space, right? I was always kind of terrified that the viewer was just gonna kind of get their attention shot off the edges. So, you know, I would have like a dragon and then I'd make his tail kind of come up and behind and then maybe a bird flying in between the head and the tail that would kind of link it, you know, even if the bird's in the far background, uh, things like that or mermaids or anything else. Um, I don't use it as much in my landscapes, um, but it's, it's a good idea to kind of figure out how do I keep the viewer in the scene? How do I keep them traveling along without like just shooting off to the side, right? Remember that Maynard Dixon painting that we saw? I told you that everything was kind of leaning right or heading right towards the right side of that image with the horses running off. Um, so having a circular formation can really help to keep the eye moving around. You guys see the circles in these? Yeah. Okay, great. S-curve. Again, this is the um, my most common. I will use S-curves or implied S-curves a lot. Um, and it just, for me, it's very welcoming. It gives you a way into the scene, whether it's a creek or a path or a dirt road or whatever it is, um, and a way to move in. I, I literally have S-curves in probably most all of my paintings in one way or another, usually in conjunction with one of these other uh, formations. I often like to do the S-curve with a steel yard on the top. Like your lean, your the S curve leads you into a steel yard. So I'll have the field in the foreground, or the whatever, with either a dirt road or a path or a creek leading you back, and then I'll have an overweighted one side or the other, and a counterbalance tree or a bush or whatever on the other side. So now that I've told you that, you guys are going to laugh because you'll see it everywhere in my paintings. But. It's not even, it's somewhat intentional, but it's just what I'm attracted to when I'm out taking photos and when I'm, you know, looking for scenery. Uh, my buddy, Don Bishop, he's very attracted to the steel yard or the L formation and uses it all the time. So it's really interesting how we all kind of gravitate naturally um, towards different sorts of design. Um, here he does again. So the steel yard, a reverse steel yard with the smaller object, the larger object. The O formation, look at how beautifully that works. And I think I found, oh no, I found the finished painting of this one. So we'll get to look at it. But you see how that just kind of keeps the viewer and it almost works like a frame for this backdrop. And even this is kind of a circular formation, even though it's quite broken, this little hint of a line will oftentimes serve enough to bring the viewer back in. So it doesn't have to be a full circle. It doesn't have to be overly imposed. A lot of these um, design armatures are, are implied. We don't have to beat people over the head with it. It's just a way of making our design, of building our painting on top of, and in some way helping to lead the viewer's eye or our own intentions. Michael, are those... Uh... The illustrations you've got right there, are they in one of those books in particular or those pages yeah, that you've those got are, there? These are all from the Edgar Payne okay. composition of outdoor painting book. Okay, thank you. And again, I've also uh, gave them to you in the email and in the on the Padlet page. All right, might take me a half a second. Here's examples he's done. And he gives you the little 
note at the bottom. And sometimes they're not as obvious. Like he's saying that this is a steel yard. So he's got the big and the L shape. But you can see that it's just very subtly in there. Like if I were didn't have his little note at the bottom, it might take me a second to figure out. I could go, oh, maybe there's a little bit of a circular formation in this. It's also got the cross in it. It almost looks like a triangle. It also has the triangle. So yeah, you can see he was really, he would really take all of his sketches um, from outdoors indoors and you'd spend a lot of time outdoors observing but his paintings are so well thought out that you know it's pretty obvious that he was painting them indoors and not you know just from life he was really making studies making lots of notes and really trying to work on the underlying design sorry the cut top of this is cut off here but yeah here's the triangle um he says this one is a mass of triangles and i, I don't know what's cut off on the top there um yeah, radiating line, but I could see this as the cross as well. Um, but yeah, as these angles kind of lead us in towards the focal point. Uh, group mass. Um, this isn't one we've talked about here, but I think I have more notes on this in a second. And he does this a lot, and I will show you examples of this by other artists. But a lot of times people will have like the dark areas or the shadow structures or the darker masses kind of massed together. And then the lights become kind of special as they radiate out or as they move out of the space. Um, we'll, we'll find some better examples of that here. The pyramid here is a little more obvious, right? Sailboats were probably why he was so attracted to them. Um, also, he's saying that he has a steel yard. Yeah. So when he calls this an O formation, I myself have thought of it as more of a diamond. A lot of times I will use the diamond formation. He's calling it a circle because it's still moving the viewer within the space. Uh, triangle, but moved off to the side, which is really a great way to do it so it doesn't become stagnant and still. And he could have easily told us this was a triangle and this is what I would think is a triangle with a cross and an S curve all in the one. So you guys see that how you could combine multiple design elements and how yeah. a lot of times if you were starting your painting, you could very loosely draw your triangle and be like, no, I can't put the boats right there. It's too, too repetitive, too obvious. Let's move the triangle off to the side. Oh, now look, I've got a triangle. But I've also got this little nice counterweight of these figures on a boat in the shadow, right? Group masses, steel yard, triangle. It's a lot of fun. Just once you kind of start to realize these group mass again, he's saying this is an O, S, or a pyramid. And I would say, yes, it's all of those. And then you could even say almost a bit of a cross or a, even a hint of a steel yard, depending on what how much weight of line he gives to these elements in the finished painting. The O is right. Yeah, you can kind of see it again. You see why I call it a pyramid or a diamond oftentimes. It looks okay. like he's sort of more talking about the negative space as the O. Yeah, exactly. Or the light space. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And that is really, that's a great point. Thank you is that it's not always the darks that are giving you the information or leading the eye. A lot of times it is the lights in contrast with the darks. All right, I think we've got that. I don't know where my handout is. I'm kind of looking across my screen. I don't know where my handout of masked objects is. So we'll see if we can't see that. I'm gonna pop us over. <clears throat> So in our Padlet page, hopefully you guys are all seeing that there. I've got these handouts. It goes into even a little more detail and a couple more examples. You are more than welcome to print those out or to look through them. Oh, here's one that we didn't get to see that I use a lot is the tunnel. Right? And that's just a really nice and obvious way to lead the viewer through it. Um, in his book, he also has a really nice section on what not to do or what you know can kind of be disruptive to these patterns. I don't have those copied. Um, 
but we're yeah that's really useful and what we what i put on here if i can get to the top you know so let's pop over to pinterest and i just made a section there of just some paintings i grabbed that we can look at and let's just kind of discuss and see you know some of them are going to be a little more difficult some of them are going to be really quite obvious the problem is once I pop it up, I have to go back to that page. Are you guys able to see this image okay of Chauncey Ryder's painting? Yes. Yeah. I really yeah. like his work. He does these beautiful, the almost calligraphic trees that I really like. All right. So what would you think are some of the design elements that he's using in this painting? Triangle. Triangle, yeah. I do see that, right? Steel yard. Steel yard, heavyweight with counterweight. What about a circle? Circle also. Yeah. So it's just so interesting how these artists use that. And like, here's another Chauncey writer. And you can see him, he's using the exact same tools. And there's the circle, the reverse steel yard with kind of a uh, weights of justice or what do you call it? The, uh, you know, a little more equally weighted. Um, that's one of mine. All right. What do we got here? Radiating lines. Yes, good. I was afraid that one would get lost, but yes, good job. Radiating lines with a bit of a steel yard, but it's kind of a condensed steel yard where it's further in the space. And yeah, look at, so he's got the radiating lines and even uses the little bit of a boat to create an angle down in the water. Um, isn't that interesting to start to look at these paintings? Yeah, a bit of a cross yeah. as well. Good job. Good. I didn't even pick up on that one, but you're right. All right, this is Brian Blood, painter out of California. I don't know how to make them. What happens if I push this? A little bit bigger, I guess. Definitely an S curve. Yes, exactly. The S curve going back. Kind of got almost like a steel yard with the big dark shape and the smaller shapes, but not quite. This is almost like a creating balance from a small dark, which is definitely weighted to a bigger light. But yeah, the S curve is the lead in. Um, yeah, that seems like a dark mass. Kind yeah, of. definitely a big yeah. dark mass. And then he also has the triangle in here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as you guys are looking at work, you know, on Facebook or Instagram or th through your books, just spend a half a second or two and just kind of asking yourself, what are, what tools is this artist using, if any, right? Some are really hard to decipher. And it doesn't mean that every painting has this, but this is a great tool for us as designers to be aware of and to use and then to know how to break it as well. All right, what do we got here, guys? Steel yard. Steel yard. Isn't that yeah. great? So Glenn Dean, too, uh, he's very much a, he paints a lot like Edgar Payne. He's a, he's a modern version of Edgar Payne. His paintings are really quite beautiful and a lot of really nice design elements. I almost went and pulled up his name just knowing that he would do uh, so much design. I'm going to pop over to this one, which is the one that was on my list, but I love Arthur Frank Matthews paintings. Um, cross? Yeah, a cross. Exactly what I would think. Yeah, a tiny bit of a steel yard within this space. So sometimes you have designs within designs. He also almost has a radiating line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's kind of an example of what I was talking about earlier that I like a lot, where I have a bigger field, and I'll just try and take the viewer up and then kind of get that steel yard kind of feel or an L. So kind of you got a, a little bit of an implied S curve, right? It's nothing really yeah. strong. The line gets broken. Wish that you. What is that going to do? Huh. A little bigger. Um, but you can see how there's an implied S-curve. And the eye will just go from here to there with just barely a little bit of nudging. We don't have to be like really pushing. And then it turns up into here and then across, right? It, whose painting is that? 
I'm not positive. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just grabbed them off Pinterest this morning, so and it doesn't say. Mm. I think it might be Sherry Schmidt, but I'm not positive. Looks like it. Or Simon Adaman? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, both of those guys I like a lot. Um, I don't want to go, you know, too crazy looking at you can see I grabbed like 40 or 50 of them for us to look through. Um, I mean, look at how extremely strong this is Amanda Houston. She's a good friend of mine that doesn't live far away. Um, but look at that strong L, right? Yeah. Boom, boom. Um, I actually looked her up because I think she's a master at the radiating line. And even within this, there is some radiating line with everything kind of bringing us back to this point. Right? Even her subtle clouds. So it's a big L, but to make it so it's not so boring, she adds movement by angling her shadows, angling her branches, angling her clouds. Um, she's a lot of fun to paint with. She's so smart. And she's actually the one that taught me the word armature for design armature. I was assisting in one of her classes and workshops. I thought this was a really interesting. T. Allen Lawson, fantastic painter. Guy's amazing. I um, thought this was a really interesting use of what I perceive to be radiating line, but it's a cast shadow from behind us, right? The light, these things are being face lit. And so he's standing in the shadows of the trees behind him. I thought that was really neat, really interesting. Yeah. Right. So it's got the radiating line. Everything is kind of pointing us into this little area, right? And that's he's got even the, the color. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. The only oranges are in there. Yeah, pretty clever guy. This T. Allen Lawson. Um, I think his name is Mark Bonet, I believe, or Bone. I'm not sure. B O H N E. Mark M A R C. Um. I really like looking at his work. His work is kind of almost graphic, um, but I just think that his design skills are phenomenal. These are all his here. Um, I could look at any of these and just say, I mean, look at that, how he's connected the darks, big shape, small shape. Um, it's kind of the, got a, this is almost the circle, in my opinion. It's almost like a donut, <laughs> mm -hmm. a donut hole. Um, and the uh, massing of, objects he really is not afraid just to center his mass and just tell you look here this painting is about a bush look here <laughs> this painting is about a bush and some trees uh but he does such a great job this is a uh, joseph uh Alleman there but i'm always curious you know like i don't think i would be brave enough just to go and put my bush smack dab in the center of my painting but it's amazing how other painters do these things and how do they get away with it? Why is that successful in that? Or like, I'm very always, where'd that go? Whoops. All right, that page disappeared. Um, massing of shapes, basically. I mean, this is so flat and I would I would think boring on its face, but it really works because of these nice angles and she kept her dark I think it's a she I think that oh yeah Laura um I how she kept these masses interesting enough and you know some broken edges and some clouds that kind of lead the viewer back in so it's just looking at people's paintings and saying how if it works to you how and why is it working All right here's that arch that we were talking about or the tunnel yeah. see that one quite a lot and it also has radiating lines mm -hmm. this was one that i almost didn't grab but i grabbed it just because i thought it was so so wild and so interesting to just put that hay bale and really just say this painting is about this hay bale but they sure found the beauty in it with the cool purples and the warm reds and the lights and the darks, and then this very heavily texturized um, sky to kind of help compact, you know, to, to give it balance. Um, but yeah, this one was a tough one for me. I was really trying to figure out what design elements are in this. What do you guys think? Kind of a circle. 
The cross. Yeah. It could be a cross. You're right. I didn't even think of that one. It's got some and radiating then, lines yeah, too. I was gonna say it also has the radiating lines with the slightly cast shadow of the hay bale, and then a lot of the clouds kind of coming in. Um, yeah, that was a tougher one, but I just thought it was so interesting. It just it stopped me while I was looking for scenes. Let's look at some of um, Edgar Payne's paintings. Yes. Michael, I have a question, please. Of course. Um, I don't think I understand completely about the radiating lines. I mean, I must be missing something or just talking about lines to even it out, like the light sources and the other things. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. No, it's, you know, how like when you're a little kid and you draw the sun and then you draw yep. all the light rays coming off it. Yes. And they yes. look like, you know, little spider arms coming off it in every direction. Okay. That's what it is. So okay. I'll find a radiating line here in just a little bit. This okay. would be more like the cross, right? Yeah. Also a triangle. Oh, yeah, obviously. Yeah, great. Thank you. I missed that one. Um, this is one that I actually was studying. You guys saw the wave painting that I shared last week. This is one of the paintings that I was looking at for reference of, you know, how, how do the waves just kind of when they get all messy and in, in amongst the rocks. Um, and I was really observing how he's using the S curve, right? Mm -hmm. Right? It's not always a, yeah. a simple creek or a thing kind of coming in there. Here's another one that I really love of his and, and one that I observed. This one's a little more obvious of an S curve, isn't it? Really mm -hmm. leads you or back to the little tri triangle uh, <laughs> focal point. Mm -hmm. So this one's a little more obvious, but I, you know, I was still utilizing or want to utilize that a little more in those paintings of how he's using the foam, which it does naturally, right? It looks naturalistic, but what a great tool he was pre presented with and took advantage of in his painting. Um, yeah, there's this one. So this is one of his little field sketches. I really love his little quick studies that he did while he was out uh, out in plain air. And this one's very much a pyramid to me, right? If we wanted to look within this one, Tamara, at a bit of a radiating line, I would say that he's kind of telling us the focal point is here because he's kind of got this balance here, leading the view back into here. It could be a triangle. But what he's done is he's got his clouds kind of leaning in this mountain's leaning in, these lines are leading in, these lines are leading in, these lines are leading in, and they're all kind of radiating around this. It's not a strong, strong example of that, but he's using a triangle, uh, what I would call a, a, a diamond, he calls a circle, and with hints of a radiating line within. So it's like design within design. That one seems a little bit like the balance scale too. Of any yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's using that to kind of get you past this point. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I see the scale, it's almost used as a framing device. Yeah, good point. Here's the circle again. Remember the sketch that we saw? I believe this is probably one of the paintings he did with it. So he's kind of creating this window in here. He's almost using the trees as a framing device to get us back into there. And even the cloud. Yeah, kind of continues the shape, doesn't it, right there? When you say triangle, or you also you could say pyramid, right? Pyramid is the same. Yep, yep, yep. One hundred percent. Yeah, pyramid would be probably the term used most. Um, Over there on the far right. Yep. Sorry. Oh, you're right. Uh, and up. Uh, that one is a good radiating lines example. Yes, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can kind of see that, Tamara, if you were, you know, drawing the sun. Literally, everything's kind of coming back to that. So do you see that? That one's a pretty uh, obvious one. If we took a pen and drew over the top, we could really easily see this. Um, Hester Berry, I love their work, um, does quite a lot of that. Very, very loose and gestural, expressive work. I'm just amazed by what they get with how little they put into it. Like, it's almost abstracted. It's not just crazy, mm -hmm. gorgeous, and so wild. This one's almost a cross for me. Let's 
I mean, all right, this one's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's our pyramid. Grab this one and one other at the same time just to show two very different examples of the same design element. Um, yeah, here's his circle within the within the landscape. So we're in that one right there, the radiating lines are like the shadows pulling away from it. No, they're leading you, they're taking you into it as well. Yeah, okay. that's funny. I did a painting of this in one of the classes I taken. Uh, good choice. It's one of my very favorite paintings ever. I just love this painting. I have uh, some photos that I took a couple years ago of some fall trees that are somewhat similar. Um, and uh, I keep meaning to get back to it and paint them. But within this one, he's using the circle. Right? I bet you it's even the same yeah. strand of trees, but he just changed where he was standing a little bit. What's the title of that painting, California Trees? Yes, something. I think it's as simple as that. I can't remember that one. Um, yeah, I don't know. That it's up to the whoever posted it to give us the information. Yeah. Sycamore in autumn. Oh, oh sycamore in autumn. It. Sycamore in autumn. Perfect. Yeah, he wasn't the most uh, descriptive of painters. Here's a one I thought was pretty neat of the radiating line. Right, everything's bringing us into this point. I don't know. It's just fun. Um, this one almost has kind of the circle in it. He's also got the weights of uh, balance of. Uh, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's I, I really enjoy observing and just kind of looking and seeing. Here's radiating line again. You can see how useful that is as getting the viewers back. Oh, I want to go back to that one because the one that popped up underneath it was glorious. All right. So he's got the radiating line on the bottom. And then horizontal on top because he wants it to be calmer and stiller and just kind of keep us within this space. I don't. I've never seen that painting. I don't know that artist, Joseph Rapitsky. Um, I don't know if you guys ever go on Pinterest, but boy, is it dangerous for me to go on here because every painting I think I like, I click on it, and all of a sudden, you know, here's the S curve. Um, and all of a sudden you can just scroll down and it gives you a whole bunch of more eye candy to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just kind of looking through and just going, okay, oh, oh, got a counterweighted steel yard over here. We've got an S curve here. I don't know exactly what this one would be, but I love that painting. So it's just, you know, even if they're not using exactly the armatures that we've discussed, it's trying to figure out why does that work? And it is kind of a steel yard right up here with almost like radiating lines leading us into this area. And then he uses the steel yard to move us back throughout the painting. Got a loose S curve in there too. It kind of does, yeah. If we kind of follow that. Oh yeah, and then it bounces back here. Very nice, good job. <laughs> All right. All right, is that probably enough of that? You guys kind of get the idea of how to look at paintings and a couple, I, give, I gave you eight different armatures for you to begin to, just to observe. And again, we don't need them to be overly strong or overly, you know, dominant, but it's just a great way. A lot of times, you know, when I'm out painting with friends, I'll see their first couple lines will literally be kind of what's the big armature. They'll literally draw a big cross or a big steel yard L shape, you know, just loosely, lightly on their painting or the radiating lines of kind of like, this is where the focal point's going to be. Um, but as we scroll through these, you know, lots of them just break all those rules, right? This is a very centered tree. You know, if one of you guys painted this, um, I'd be like, oh, you know, maybe if you move the tree over, it'd be a little more, uh, a little better, but I'm not going to um, argue with Michael Workman because he's one of my heroes, 
and he's always testing and trying out different ideas. He's really interesting. If you ever get a chance to watch any of the videos where he's interviewed and stuff, he really uh, loves to just mess with design and mess with, here'd be a good example of one of his paintings as well. Um, he also has that really soft edge and stuff that I just love in my work. Um, but yeah, interesting kind of a reverse steel yard a little bit at the base. Um, and then it's all about this area back in here. Now, lots of harmony in his paintings. <clears throat> all right, what time is it? Oh, we only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and jump up to the easel anyways. And like, let's look at a painting I've got up there. Good. And we will just paint and uh, for a little bit. Let me change cameras. There it is. All right, let me pop up there. I'm gonna move the camera a little bit. So if you get seasick when I move the camera, divert your attention for a second here. That was the steel yard with the S curve that I was gonna do as a demo, but I think we have time for just one. So this is a painting that I've painted over actually a couple times, retaining certain elements. Um, I just added the bright pink into it, thinking I could use a splash. And now that this color is so vibrant, I, I felt free to come back in. And I'm going to use some of these and accentuate some of these angles to create a little bit more of a radiating line into this painting. Um, also, as we're getting closer to uh, the winter months, and I know that frost and snow hopefully are coming, I thought it might be fun to actually play up a little bit of that idea. I'm going to be using mostly kind of uh, greens, purples, and blues, and playing in this area. And then if we have a little bit of time, I thought it might be fun to bring in some kind of like phthalo -y green a little bit into this and see if we can't accentuate that. So I'm gonna just quickly take some colors and mix up a little dash. Um, this blue up here is probably one I haven't used in this class. It is called King's Blue, and it's a kind mm -hmm. of a nice gray down blue. Yeah. Um, I don't use it very often, but it sure does make some beautiful fuchsias and purples, and it's a way of using um, blues that aren't too strong. I also, this color of blue, I'm not sure what it is because it was a mixture of a, just a couple dark blues. I think maybe there's some phthalo in there. Could you please say the name of that blue that you don't use very often again? King's blue. blue. Thank you. Right. So, Michael, is this a uh, underpainting? Uh... It's a painting that just keeps getting worked and reworked as I kind of change oh. my ideas on it. Okay. I've got a big weight on here that's making it slowly slide down. Is the painting on the right side or the left side of the screen for you? It is right side. Okay. I'm seeing it in reverse on my screen. It's on the right side for me. Okay, great. Which shade of pink is that? I mean, this one is the, uh, what is it called? Radiant pink. And that's what I kind of glazed over all of this just to see what that would do. And it made a very vibrant sky that I was like, oh, that's much better than what I had before. But then this became very dark and quiet and still. And I thought, you know what? Might be fun to see if I can push some real strong contrasts in there. So I'm just kind of trying to figure out a blue that I'd be comfortable with. And maybe let's even see what happens if I send it to a little bit on the greener side. Yeah, this was a very quick decision before class. Just picked up this painting that I don't quite like, but I almost like and thought maybe it could be interesting. So let's start, I'm gonna go ahead and start in the background here where the sun is kind of peeking over the edge and then I'll probably come forward 
and start to really play up some of these radiating lines. And then again, my idea was to bring a little bit of uh, some cooler colors to cut into that to again, radiate down there. But I don't want to again, I don't want to be too obvious. So let's, let's even pick up a little bit of that pink. And let's bring some of that light over the edge, just as if it's kind of permeating. Whew, so pretty. Michael, was this one that you did an acrylic underpainting for and now you're using oils? No, it's been oils the whole time. I actually oh. did this at plain air a long time ago, but was never happy with it, never finished it. Um, so then I've reworked it a couple times just when I have different ideas. So it's, so far, it's just kind of been a sketchy painting that sits in the corner of my studio for <laughs> from time to time. I'll touch it and use it as a, an experimental surface. Mm -hmm. Now I'm bringing a little bit of a cooler blue. And I've got that get, even get cooler, but I want to lighten this hill a little bit. And I just have very loose ideas of kind of where I think it might be nice to have it go. So now that looks like it glows in the dark, right? It's almost, it's so vibrant and so strong of a blue that I could either get nervous right now and knock it back, or I can let it play for a little bit and see when I introduce blue to the rest of this area, blues and purples, if how it looks. Because right now it's the only blue besides the top of the sky. So it really feels very light, but I, my goal is to kind of lighten up the ground a little bit so that it doesn't feel like just a dark band and a big light band. So. I reserve the right to go back and change any of this if I see fit. But I do want to kind of get covered before I judge it too harshly. Because of course it looks out of place now. All right, this is where it could get a little bit nerve wracking here. This is a pretty strong, almost electric -y blue. So let's see what happens. Again, I'm trying to think of like kind of frost that might be just too electric. I may have to get some purple into that. Green. It's interesting, just trying to feel it out as you're using the paint on there. That is bright. Wonder if I'll be able to get away with that. Bright colors scare me, as you guys know. It all depends on what you do on the radiating lines going to. Right, yeah, let's, let's see. I guess I wanna kinda lighten them up a tiny bit. I'll put some blues down and I'll bring a little bit of pink from the sky reflecting down, I think. All right, wish me luck. Good luck. Good luck. Oops. Michael, you went real small. Huh. It's not yeah. here. No, there you are.
They might have to get down and darken some of these other colors. And probably have to add some of this into here. Looks like lavender fields. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And I'm I was putting, thinking. I'm putting the arches of them on there too. So yeah, we can just say they're frosty lavender, which I don't know how that would happen. Way different seasons, but. So in that painting are the the rows, are those the radiating lines? Yeah, kind of, yeah. And then I have to figure out how I would include that. You know, I have a little bit of a cloud coming down at an angle, but I probably would want more. And then I have to decide, you know, how strong of radiating lines am I trying to, you know, really, really, you know, beat the viewer over the head with the idea of radiating lines or is it... Um, a little more subtle, but a lot of times I think of these, you know, plants, these rows, the lavender, or just so many vegetables and stuff in the little farm areas just uh, west of my studio. You know, when you're driving along, you'll just see so many of the radiating lines of the plantings. Yeah, what I Right now, it's funny, wherever I left it, really got warm because of that blue next to it. And this blue still is reading far too strong for me. So I can just take a paper towel and see if we can knock that back. Yeah, that's better. But yeah, it's hard to judge until you get the other formations up there. Let's grab some of that pink that's in this area. So it's still going to be hitting across some of it. And maybe what I actually want to do too is I'm just going to grab some Payne's Gray. And let's mix that with some whatever this blue is up here. I'm going to get into my darks first and kind of figure out some of the design that I can use here. So I've got this band of trees over here, and I got the base. I want to probably get into some of these dark areas here because right now they're all reading as warm darks, but I wanna have some shadows. And I'm gonna come and describe this here in a little bit better. I'm just kind of putting some splashes of those darks to see how they read. And then I can decide if I want to spend a lot of time giving them detail and information. All right, I think that's kind of helping. Yes. And then I'm gonna make a lighter blue but a dark to get these other this other band of darks a little darker than that. How can I keep this radiating line going towards here from here? Maybe I'll just do a little line like that. Oh, yeah, having those darks really helps to ground that all of a sudden, doesn't it, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. looking really good. I'm going to let my edges of these darks get a little warmer, but not lighter, not too much lighter, a little bit lighter maybe, but a little bit warmer. Again, I'm using the same value as the dark blues that I put at the bases. 
but I'm letting my color get a little warmer, even though the value again is staying pretty similar. Now meet them in the middle and kind of a mixture of those temperatures. I don't know if you're able to see this subtle shift in the darks getting a little bit warmer as they get. Yeah. Yeah, pretty hard to see in shiny darks. Phew. When I was first doing this, I was really thinking, what a mistake I've made. But now that I've got these darks beginning in there, feeling much more comfortable. Just a comment, Michael. Please. Um, I, I think that, at least for me, I'm sitting here watching you and I, I'm thinking about all the other pieces of art that we've seen from what you showed and from other folks in the class. I, I think that you'd have to be so confident in your, your skills or your ability because I'm sitting here and like I said, I've looked at everything everybody has offered and I'm like, holy cow, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to paint like that. So it's like you. I find myself going through these periods of like total inadequacy to no, wait a minute, what you do is different than this and that's okay. I mean, do, do all accomplished painters, did they, did they go through that? Or is, I mean, I'm just thinking about the emotional journey of what uh -huh. people go through. Yeah. I think everybody does, don't they, Michael? <laughs> Uh, I hope Don't so. I, I mean, probably not really confident painters, but they're probably a little bit, um, what's the word, uh, overly confident. But yeah, it, it is weird because there's definitely times where I get frozen with fear, but I usually get myself out of it by just kind of getting braver and just attacking it. Um, but I'm also willing to destroy a painting this in this instance over and over and over again just with the free knowledge that oh now I can just have fun like this painting's already been in the dumpster a couple times so I can just be free and liberated but yeah it takes a long time I mean you've got to remember I've been doing this for quite a while now and I'm still not even you know too close to where I hope I could be and when I look at those paintings, when I look at Edgar Payne or other painters, I'm just like, oh my gosh, am I ever going to be that? And then you have to, like you said, oh, I'm not, I'm never going to be Edgar Payne. I'm never going to be, you know, Don Bishop. I'm never going to be a lot of these painters. And it would be dumb if I was because I'm not an artist to, you know, mimic or copy. I'm an artist to help tell my story or my feelings or my emotions or whatever it is. So yeah, no, it's, it is, it's so daunting, but we have to just go, okay, it's not about that. It is about literally the journey. It's about our little successes and our little wins and our little, you know, this painting was better than the painting before, hopefully. And that doesn't even always go in that trajectory. It is definitely not a, you know, straight up, Oh, now I know how to paint. I will never mess up again. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, you know, whatever cheesy uh, car stickers be damned, but it is literally the journey. And every painting is a little piece in that journey. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you knock them out of the park or you just amaze yourself 
almost accidentally and other times it feels like there's feels like there's times when I'm looking back at my paintings and I feel like I was a better painter two years ago than what I'm doing this year why is that and it's oftentimes because oh I'm experimenting I'm trying new things I'm pushing new boundaries and I'm you know stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit um yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And I think I would love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Well, number one, I think you're in Edgar Edgar Payne's category. And, oh. you know, and I, and I think it's probably he's had all of those same feelings himself. I think okay. all artists do. Absolutely. And it's our own human frailty that we fall on when we feel that we're not doing it like other people are as good as we think we should we, we're harder on ourselves than anybody else could be you know well and said. i and i appreciate your very kind um guidance and and the way you handle helping us that to me that is like you're speaking from your soul very kindly to us you know i've been in classes where instructors were not so kind and they took it as an offense. If you didn't copy exactly what they did in your creations, not copying their work, but copying like the design skill or whatever. And they would be insulted if you didn't, you know, or if you did something better than they did. And they, you know, it was just, I've had all kinds of teachers and Michael, from my heart to yours and everybody listening, um, I thank God for, for finding you. I really do. Amen. So kind of you. No, just honest, Michael. <laughs> but yeah, it is it is a constant, constant um challenge. And the truth is, I mean, it's rumored or whatever the myth is that um Monet on his deathbed said, Oh, I was getting close. <laughs> and I love <laughs> to think about that because we're all on our own journey. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I look at it, Monet's paintings and just like, oh, if I could ever. And he was looking at his own paintings and thinking the artist that he isn't yet. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would frown very much upon any artist or teacher that's like, says they know it. I hope, I hope I represent my teaching and my painting and that I'm on the same journey as you guys are. I'm just a little bit further along, but again, it's my journey, not yours. Um, so I'm further along on my journey. Um, I, I think that's helpful, the whole thing about your, your journey, because one of the things that you bring up is your personal experiences. And I think that's really uh, helpful, I'm you know, good. your journey, personal experience. I think that's really helpful. Hugs. Thank you. Hugs. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I mean, the other thing is, like, I have, you know, ADHD and dyslexia, which you know, that luckily for my, I had great parents, but, you know, all throughout school up through seventh grade, they were trying to literally beat that out of the students. And it wasn't until, you know, meeting people that had grown up with it were then people that I aspired towards, artists and different things. And there's like, no, it's not a weakness. It's not a curse. It's a gift. You literally see the world differently than other people. And, um, so I try to remember that too, is like, we all literally see the world differently. I don't think, I think, you know, they call it neurodivergent, but I literally don't think there's very many people I've ever met, at least not interesting people who are neuro, neurotypical. I think we're all just neurodivergent in our own way. And so you kind of lean in towards that. I mean, some, you know, I've got so many students who take my classes and kind of are like, wait, I don't want to paint tonalism. I don't want to paint gray colors. Or, you know, I don't want to paint landscapes. I want to paint horses and stuff. And that's good. That you Paint what is attractive to you. Paint what is exciting to you because painting's already hard enough if you're forcing yourself to paint things that you don't care about just because you think it's going to make you better. I find that really difficult. Um, I equate it to my daughter had a piano teacher who was famous, you know, in the area and really good teacher, but she only let the kids play classical music. And my daughter just was having none of it and you know she ended up quitting and we got her another teacher but unfortunately moved away and she's never played since then and uh, I think if she had had that you know let's oh you like you know 
this song let's learn this song oh you like this style let's learn this style because it's so much more fun if you want to be at the piano it's so much more fun if you want to be at the easel all right now i'm scared i'm gonna i want to add some crazy colors in the sky i'm gonna take a little bit of painting medium uh thin it down a tiny bit just so i have a, a slightly slicker surface so that when I <laughs> when I go, holy cow, what have you done, Michael? I can hopefully remove it a little bit easier. So let's just let's have fun. So I'm just gonna wipe it on this paint medium. It's um just a little bit of medium gel, and I mixed a little bit of paint thinner just to get it a little more liquid. And I'm going to be glazing into this sky with some colors that aren't really in here. Some of these kind of blues, but I wanted them to kind of go a little more green because I think the green plays so well off this pink. But then part of me is like, but that's a lot. That is a lot of color contrast, a lot of temperature contrast. So this is experimenting. I have no idea this could be. Yeah, I'll, I'll be waiting to hear the gasps as I progress into this. That seems almost too bright. I was thinking the same thing about how you're you're so brave when you put that blue down originally, but but also you do you say you have no idea, but I think you really do have an idea. <clears throat> because you you know what you're gonna do after you put that blue down. Yeah, wipe it away and then throw it away. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, but it's, I don't know, because again, this vibrancy is so vibrant, right? For if you know my work, my paintings are mostly gray, but again, it's these paintings that are less than successful are so liberating. Will you put hints of some of the sky? Well, you have the blue on the ground, but some of that green, I love it. Oh, I wonder. It is too. In the fields, I'll bet that would be just like the sparkle on the cake. <laughs> some sprinkles. Yes. And I'm just curious how, because I keep putting down these light areas, but the reading is too light, so I can have it a little darker. I'd hang that on my wall. It's uh, beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I've got a clean brush here. Well, it's the brush I put the medium on. I'm just going to wipe it. I'm going to just maneuver this a little bit because I know I have sort of a slick surface. I, mean, I'm, I want it to be a little more translucent, meaning letting some of that pink show through. I don't want it to be quite as strong. And I should be manipulating it in a little bit more of a spirally fashion, probably. <clears throat> How to paint this without hitting the camera. I do wish I had kind of thought out what shapes I might want these clouds, but I'm going to do kind of a subtractive sculptural approach to it a little bit here. Have I lost most of you? You're just like, oh, no, what has Michael done again? 
It's just paint. You can cover it. Yeah, I'm going to cover it and I'm going to wipe it away. I like it. Okay. It's very nice. I've seen skies like that. That I love that green in it. I do too. Too late, too fast. Would a little bit go in that back field there a little bit, just giving because it's a little more Very flat close. looking. All right, so I've got this. I kind of I'm radiating lines, I guess, kind of towards here, even though this would probably be better. So maybe radiate move here. Let's see what happens with. step back a little bit because it's pretty hard to see so close plus it's very shiny Yeah, let's see. How do I control that green a little bit to put it down below? Because yeah, now it's two different scenes again. So you're right, I think, with that idea. If I can bring just hints of it. Ah, smaller brush. Just hints of it. Just kind of a speckling, letting the brush is kind of skim across. Now that color just pushed it, really gave it good distance. I'm good. Let's bring a tiny bit of the darker, more intense, maybe a little hints of it into here. Into the shade. Yeah. There you go. I love that. Just kind of keying it in. But it doesn't feel like each section is separate of the other. Fun, fun, fun. Well, I like it much more than when I started it. So that's a win. And then it was fun painting it with you guys and getting ideas. Um, so I appreciate it. And you can still see it's a little bit of like there's more radiating line. I think I could still push it if I really wanted to call this a radiating line painting. But I wanted this to be a little more subtle, but to have some movement because before it was just a big bright patch getting to a lesser bright patch. And now I've got movement, I've got line, I've got light and dark, but still everything stays within the shadow here because the sun hasn't really risen, um, but the sky is being illuminated from beneath. Um, I could probably grab a clean paper towel and maybe remove a little bit more paint in the sky. It's I, like of, it. I like it, I like it. I like it. I like it. I'm gonna let the light come through a tiny mm -hmm. bit more on the base of some of these clouds. Oh, that was fun. Beautiful. Yeah, and I can come back in because a lot of this is really just dabby. What the, you know, the brush stroke, I can come through and take a smaller brush and kind of make some of these shapes a little more interesting. Um, maybe decide if I want maybe one or two more 
trees. So I don't have one just kind of in the middle here, maybe one or two more here or one closer to the edge and something like that to break that up. Um, having the tallest tree on the edge is a little bit weird and I don't like the st really strong top to it. So figuring out maybe to break that up. But again, I'll do that all when I can actually stand in front of the camera, uh, in front of the, uh, the scene without knocking it over. Again, that's the L formation that I wanted to do with the S-curve, um, but this was way more fun. It was fun to watch. Thank you for letting me play. Now I want you guys to go and play. You deserved it after sitting for five hours listening to me talk. Woo, it's beautiful, Michael. I yeah, love that's it. That's awesome. Thank you, um yeah thank you guys um i really appreciate your willing to sit and listen to design talk for that long i helpful. do hope it was very informational and i hope that you have a good time looking at other work again it is so fun to look at other paintings and say why does this work or why am i attracted to it you know is it the colors is it the brushwork is it the theme is it the subject or and then if i am attracted to it why does it work you know, is it the design? Is it the composition? Is it the value structure? Is it the, you know, colors? Is it the less, the, the lack of colors um, and why? So just looking and it'll help you to develop your style faster. And it will also just make art that much more interesting. It's, you know, you guys are all junior magicians, right? And so we all want to look and see how do these magicians out there do their thing? And slowly, piece by piece, you're going to get to start to figure it out. Like, oh, it's just a lot of little things, you know, figuring out design and composition. Oh, how do colors work? Oh, you know, mother colors. Oh, you know, doing some preliminary sketches really goes a long way to figuring out those magic tricks that are the finished paintings that we see hanging on the gallery walls. So anyways, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Your homework is you. just Michael. keep painting. <laughs> just <laughs> keep painting. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Get some rest. You had so much <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Yep. All right.